Hi everyone, my name is Xu Xiao, Professor George Mason, running the Robotics Lab. Today, it's my pleasure to talk to you about our journey on enabling robots to learn on the job. In September 2014, 11 years ago, I attended the very first robotics conference in my career, IROS 2014, in Chicago. A professor named Robin Murphy delivered a keynote speech on lessons learned from in field robotics from disasters. So playing a video feed from an onboard camera of a robot deployed underneath the rubbles after 9-11, Dr. Murphy pointed to something in the video and said, if we had known this wasn't a rock, but someone's head, we could have saved their life. This single daunting sentence profoundly changed the course of my life. That night, sleepless and inspired, I applied to Texas A&M and emailed Dr. Murphy, who would later become my PhD advisor. This marked the beginning of a journey dedicated to developing capable and intelligent robots that redefine how we respond to disasters, save human lives, and also expand the boundaries of human possibilities. In the last decades, I devoted my entire career building robots and deploying them in disasters for search and rescue missions. On the left, snake robots can maneuver underneath rubbles, so we deploy them after the Mexico City earthquake to search for victims. We leverage overhead security cameras and a local motive reduction techniques to autonomously drive snake robots. In the middle, facing the Greece refugee crisis in 2015, we developed a collaborative team of unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, and unmanned surface vehicles, USVs, called EMILY, to assist the Greek Coast Guard to look for victims from the aerial footages and also driving the USV as life-saving flotation device. On the right-hand side, so this is my PhD thesis, which tackles the ongoing Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster decommissioning. So initially, two human crews were required to manually tally up a two ground robots in the contaminant power plant, one robot only to watch and guide the other. So we developed an aerial visual assistant robot that flies autonomously around the ground robot, providing critical visual feedback of the remote scene and eliminating the need of the secondary tally operated ground robot and its human crew. Being tested in Fukushima in 2018, our system paves the way towards a more efficient and safer decommissioning process projected to span 30 to 40 years. All these robots are being developed and pre-programmed before deployment to face the very challenging disaster scenarios. So the current paradigm of robots being pre-programmed before deployment requires a lot of very privileged resources before deployment. For example, highly skilled ro robot experts or human operators that have gone through extensive training beforehand. Large-scale data sets that are created and curated with very expensive real-world missions. Simplified models to represent the environment around the robot so that the robots will know what will happen next. All these privileged information are applied to the robot before they are deployed in the field. That is why after deployment starts, robots no longer have the ability to improve or adapt to the field. Recently, our lab has created a new paradigm in which we will put robots into the deployment field at the very beginning. Instead of relying on all these privileged information before deployment, now we enable robots to identify and learn from widely easily available resources in the deployment field on the job. For example, known experts who do not know robotics are around the robot. By interacting th with them, robots can learn new skills. Instead of relying on large-scale data sets, robots' past experiences, deployment experiences in the field, doing one thing can be used to reflect on how to do other things. Robots are also constantly experiencing the environment, and by in-situ learning, the robot will figure out how the world around them evolves. All these environment resources will be used to make robots to learn, so they will start to have the capability to improve performances and also to adapt to new scenarios as they repeat a similar task many times and also gather brand new experiences. So let's dive a little deeper into it. First, I'm a roboticist myself. I know exactly how robots work, which is my job, but I may not always be available around those robots on the job. Here is actually what no expert humans can help here. So no expert humans like pedestrians or bystanders. So they do not know how robots work, but certainly they know how a working robot should look like. For example, this little robot called Jackal is navigating this complex maze. So the default or pre-programmed navigation systems does not know how to navigate this like, very narrowing corridor here, which is very difficult for Jackal. So Jackal struggles a little bit before finally going through. 
Jackal also finds it very difficult to navigate through this curving corridor, which is also very narrow. So going back and forth, almost hitting the wall, before being intervened by a human. So if we stick with the existing being pre-programmed before deployment scenario, robots will repeat these mistakes over and over until a robotics expert like me steps in, takes over, and reprogram the robot. But as mentioned earlier, I'm not always available. This is where no expert can help, which are more widely available around those robots on the job. This is Bo. So he didn't know much about robotics back in the days, but he was able to grab an Xbox controller, tell the operator robot to drive through this obstacle course even on his very first try. So using Bo's non-expert demonstration, robots is able to learn to improve performance or to learn new skills to adapt. So after learning from Bo's non-expert demonstration, Jacko now knows how to deal with this narrowing space. So it confidently drives through. So the top piece is the default behavior you have seen in the past, and the lower part is the navigation lear learning results. So as you can see here, the performance has improved. And in this narrow curving corridor door as well, both decreases speed and carefully control the steering in order to fit for the curvature. So does Jacko after learning from that learning expert demonstration. It no, no longer struggles anymore and just confidently and smoothly navigates through. In the last open space, Jacko also learns it can increase the speed to drive faster because this has shown to it by Bo during the non-expert demonstration. So robots are able to learn from these demonstrations. And remember that Bo has never even written a single line of code to reprogram the robot. But the robot is able to just learn from looking at this non-expert demonstration. So robots can learn from non-expert humans, which are just by the side on the job. Robots can also learn from just themselves, their own experiences, without any humans, especially from their past successes. How can we allow robots to reflect on all these previous successes in order to achieve more future successes? I'll give you one example here. So robots want to navigate through this obstacle course, and the goal is to come up with a sequence of actions, or we call a motion plan, to drive through without collisions. So apparently, this red motion plan works pretty well. It is a success for these obstacles in the past. Can robots also reflect on this red motion plan in order to achieve more future successes? If I ask you, how does this obstacle look for this optimal motion plan? How about these obstacles and these obstacles? If the robot is able to actually reflect on all these possible scenarios, obstacle environments, where past optimal motion plan would also be successful, would also work, then robots can learn based on those reflections. So how does reflective learning work? So by reflecting all the possible obstacle environments where existing motion plan would also work very well, robots learn to maneuver through a variety of future unseen difficult obstacle courses like this. Remember, the ro robot has never seen any of these obstacles before. And we do not need to curate a large-scale data set to include all these special cases. The robot learns how to smoothly and confidently navigate through because it has already hallucinated similar obstacle environments in the past to match with the previous successful deployment performances using all the old motion plans. So robots can learn from interacting with known experts or reflecting on past experiences. Another avenue towards learning on the job is through directly interacting, directly experiencing the real world environment around the robot in situ. So what if I do this? What about that? What are the different consequences of taking different actions? So this is called the model learning, and the robot is able to use these models in order to predict what will happen next in the future, and then pick the best possible future all through its own interactions with the environment itself. So if you drive too quickly on this bumpy terrain, the extensive vibration may cause damage to the onboard components. Turning very quickly on high friction surface may, may roll over the vehicle, and low friction will maybe cause sideways sliding or drifting on grass. If the robot is trying to drive over extremely rocky terrain, extremely rough rock like this, a large rock may cause the robot to roll over or getting stuck. So telling the robot what will happen if it does this versus if it does that is very difficult because even human programmers do not know exactly what will happen next or how much will happen. Therefore, we let robots to experience what will happen next in situ. So the power of in-situ model learning here is robots will be able to reason about, to predict what will happen, what will hypothetically happen next by imagining the future. And then by imagining the future, the robot can apply multiple actions so it will produce multiple potential trajectory rollouts as shown as those green lines. You can imagine them as parallel universes in the robot brain. 
you know, applying, imagining what will happen in the future by applying different actions. Then the robot will be able to pick the best trajectory out of those based on what matters most. For example, are we maximizing speed? Are we minimizing vibration? Or are we trying to not roll over on high friction surfaces? Or slides with sliding is not important. We can also turn aggressively on grass as well. So Institute Learning also enables robots to drive over extremely rough terrain, all these rocks here. So here, the sign lines also indicate the parallel universes in the robot's brain. The robots keep thinking about, what if I do this action on this patch of terrain elevation and show us the gray areas in this video? What will happen next? And based on its predictions of what will happen next, if the robot thinks about if I take the other action on the next terrain patch, what will happen next next? This process will be repeated many times, dozens of times, and will give us a whole trajectory rollout. And by parallelly producing thousands of those trajectory rollouts, the robot is able to pick the best trajectory. For example, the one that is minimizing the possibility of rolling over the vehicle or getting the vehicle stuck. So now we know in-situ learning can end up a very high-speed navigation or crawling over extremely rugged terrain. But what if we want to combine them? What if we want robots to drive both at very high speed, but also over extremely rugged terrain? What will happen next? You may not know the answer right off the bat of your head. That is why it is very difficult for us to program that into the robot. Again, we need to let the robot experience what will happen next itself in situ. I will give you a hint. The robot may actually become airborne. But when the robot becomes airborne, it's because it's driving too fast on an uneven terrain. It needs to land safely, get itself prepared. You don't want the robot to land on its back. Here, robots is able to use in-situ learning to learn how to maneuver in air. The robot here is launching at an almost 90 degree roll angle, but it can find a trajectory to quickly stabilize the vehicle so it can land on flat on the ground by rolling out multiple trajectories based on what model learned about the environment. So what will happen when we empower robots to learn on the job? So robots may actually learn how to fly, even though they are only built to drive. We actually named our autonomous motion planner the Dom Planner after Dominic Toretto from the Fast and Furious series, because both of them make cars fly or make our robots fly, which are only built to drive. So in summary, robots will be able to learn from known experts, from reflecting on past experiences, and also by interacting with the environment around them in situ. So what would you like to see when robots start learning on the job? Thank you. <laughs>